I'm Jennifer Game. I'm the leader of One Nation in South Australia and I want to talk to you about how One Nation is different to other political parties. These differences are the reason I vote One Nation and the reasons why I encourage others to vote One Nation. Pauline Hanson's One Nation party is different to Labor and Liberal, the coalition with the Nationals and the Greens for three important reasons. Firstly, our values are different. Secondly, we're socially conservative. And thirdly, we believe in evidence-based decision-making. We don't follow any ideology. We're practical. We don't like socialism. We don't like communism. So what are our values? Our values are equal opportunity, equality before the law, as many freedoms as possible, and the right to own private property. Now you wouldn't think that that would make us very different from the other political parties, but regrettably it does. These values answer the question, how does One Nation want to see our society organised? We believe these values will mean that no one is any less or any more than anybody else. And that's the kind of society we want. Knowing our values means that we're predictable. Our elected members are predictable because our commitment to these values helps us decide how to make decisions. In One Nation, we believe equality before the law, which means all individuals should be treated equally, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or any other characteristic. Our commitment to equality before the law means that we will not support race-based legislation like the First Nations Voice Act 2023 in South Australia. It also means we're campaigning against the voice constitutional change because we won't vote or support for any race-based legislation. The Yes Vote campaign argue race-based legislation is needed to overcome historic injustices, but we believe that injustice is better served with needs-based legislation. Governments have spent billions of dollars on helping Indigenous people in this country. And while most Aboriginal people live similar lives to most Australians, people in remote and rural communities do not. But very little of what has been done so far has made much difference to them but it has in fact created an elite Aboriginal industry and they're doing very, very nicely. At the beginning of my talk, I said oh, that One Nation was socially conservative. And so what do I mean by that? We believe that the family is the best way to bring up children and that the family is the primary educator of children. We don't support legislation that allows abortion uh, up to birth. This legislation has been passed in South Australia and it's been passed in other states. We support home ownership because it supports family stability, neighbourhoods and communities. Home ownership helps create the kind of trust people want in society and that they need. As a socially conservative political party, we appreciate the importance of stability. Now that doesn't mean that we won't make changes, but what we want to be convinced of is that those changes are going to be for the better. Here's an example where that wasn't true. In 2013, legislation was passed to remove from the law the protected attribute of biological sex, that is male and female. And that protected attribute was replaced with self-identified gender. This means that from the 1st of August 2013, discrimination is based on self-identified gender. And let me say that self-identified gender refers to a person's personal and subjective understanding of their gender identity, which may be different from the one assigned at birth. Let me say at this point that One Nation accepts people as they are. We believe all people should have the same rights, but it doesn't mean that we support the teaching of gender fluidity theory, which is unproven uh, in schools as if it were fact. And it doesn't mean that we believe that primary school children should be taught detailed sexual acts. The amendment to the Sex, the Sex Discrimination Act in 2013 gave biological men who identify as women more rights 
than biological women and girls. We don't think that improves uh, the lot of biological women and girls because biological men can use their physical advantages when competing against women in sport. Biological men can now use female safe spaces and ask to serve out their time in women's prisons for offences against women. The change to the Sex Discrimination Act in 19, 1984, which was made, as I said, in 2013, has led to schools introducing same-sex bathrooms in high schools against the wishes of young people and also their parents. And it's authorised, as I said before, the teaching of gender fluidity theory to children as young as four. And now how do I know that? Well, I've got a grandchildren and I've got one at four who, who gave me details about things that she just shouldn't be worried about and shouldn't know about. The teaching of gender fluidity to children in school from the age of four has seen a significant rise in gender confusion, particularly amongst girls. This change to the Sex Discrimination Act, which I'm talking about, has authorised policies in schools which affirm a child's change in sex without telling their parents. The same law has seen medical practitioners who look for other reasons to be banned from practice and face loss permanently of their practising rights. We're treading down the same path as the UK before the findings of the Cass Inquiry into the Tavistock Clinic in London. It's not transphobic to advocate for children who are being rushed down the path of transitioning their gender when there are many people who've taken that path and regretted it. One Nation has sought to have an inquiry in the Senate into puberty blockers, but the other parties blocked that inquiry and have blocked every opportunity to debate these matters. So I ask, what are they afraid of? While Labor, the Liberals and Greens have been focused on the sex lives of children from the age of four, educational standards have fallen in Australia for over 20 years, leaving hundreds of thousands of children leaving primary school unable to read. And if you can't read when you leave primary school, you won't be able to keep up in secondary school and you'll drop out and you won't reach your potential. And that's what we want in One Nation. We want every child to reach their potential. In One Nation, we believe getting back to basics is the way to improve educational outcomes because, as I said, we want equal opportunity for everyone. I said at the beginning that we like to use evidence and common sense, and I think that applies particularly in energy policy. In South Australia, 20 years ago, all our electricity came from coal. In 2002, the Labor government decided to incorporate large volumes of renewable energy, particularly wind and solar, into the electricity grid. Labor's dream of decarbonising the electricity grid without nuclear energy now seems unachievable and it's left South Australia with the highest electricity prices in the country and possibly the world. This, the mismatch between peak renewable electricity production, which takes place during the day, and peak demand, which is in the evening, requires a backup system. So South Australians can have a constant supply of electricity. When the sunlight and wind don't turn up for work in South Australia, the gas turbines get turned on. And in winter, gas is used every night and very commonly during the day. Sometimes 90% of our electricity production comes from gas in South Australia. And that's why we've got the highest kilowatt per hour electricity price in the country. Who'd want to come to South Australia and invest in a business when our electricity prices are so high and just go across the border to Victoria where it's 22 cents a kilowatt hour, not 35 cents. In South Australia, the government, uh, the Labor government wants to replace natural gas um, as a backup fuel with green hydrogen. And this is really where the story starts to get worse. The hydrogen strategy involves using excess wind and solar power generated during the day uh, to uh, source uh, electrolysis so that water can be split into hydrogen and oxygen. And then the hydrogen can be stored and used later. So what could possibly go wrong with such a simple strategy? Well, firstly, in South Australia, there is no excess wind and solar in winter, as I've just said. I know that because I check the Australian energy market operation figures daily, sometimes more often than daily. 
Secondly, the technology to split water into hydrogen and electricity relies on a constant electricity supply. Now, it's not done anywhere in the world because it's too expensive, but there's no technology available to do it with intermittent and variable sources like wind and solar, which is probably why they've just recently abandoned the project in Western Australia. Until these natural and technical problems are resolved, and I mean by natural the lack of wind in South Australia during winter, Natural gas will be the main backup fuel for our electricity grid. Natural gas plays an unexpected role in the price of electricity in South Australia because of an electricity rule that says if the gas turbines are turned on while wind and solar turb is being generated, electricity is being generated, then everybody gets the same price as the highest price, which is gas. So we're trapped, absolutely trapped in South Australia in a dream, a socialist dream. Today the price of electricity in Australia is more than double the price in China where they use our coal and our gas to generate electricity. As a result, we cannot compete competitively in making steel, aluminium, glass or nitrates. You have to ask yourself what difference does it make if the Earth's atmosphere, to the Earth's atmosphere, if Australian coal and gas is burned in China or in Australia. And it doesn't make any difference to the planet or the planet's future but it's going to make every difference to the living cost of Australians, the level of debt passed to the next generation and the ability of our economy to pay for the goods and services that we need. It's no surprise that we've got fewer hospital beds in South Australia today than we did in 2008. Labor and Liberals will hope that you won't see the double standards that they play of uh, heading towards net zero while we're exporting coal and gas, but we call it to your attention. We believe in one nation that voters need to have information available to them so that they can make proper decisions in their own lives and when they come to elect people. We believe freedom of speech and freedom of association is the best way for people to be informed, but the other pol political parties don't agree. And how do I know that? Because we saw them operate during COVID where they took away our freedoms. When Labor returned to power in South Australia in 2022, the first legislation they passed was a change to the Public Health Act, which will ensure that when the next pandemic comes, we will lose even more of our freedoms. That was their highest priority. One Nation was the only party in the parliament to vote against that legislation. One Nation differs from other political parties because we listen to voters, because we want to. And there's no more clear example than in migration. The big parties know high levels of immigration cause the housing affordability crisis and lead to long waiting times to see medical specialists and a host of other problems. And they know what the findings are of decades of surveys of Australians, but they ignore that. When One Nation proposed a debate on whether to ask voters at a federal election whether or not migration levels were too high, about right or too low, the Liberal government refused to have a debate. Refused. They were not willing to let Australians hear what they were not willing to let Australians' voices be heard. Not even in a debate, let alone a vote on the bill. Only months ago, we in One Nation sought a debate to end the circular definition of Aboriginal in legislation. And that definition is an Aboriginal is a person of the Aboriginal race. It's completely circular and completely useless. Anyway, again, the Labor government stopped a debate on that matter. That is, they don't want you to know what the problems are with that, especially so close to the voice referendum. Labor now proposes to give new powers to a government agency to decide what information, what information you can know about. They've decided that they can determine what's misinformation and disinformation. The Communications Legislation Amendment Combating Misinformation and Disinformation Bill 2023 proposal will see censorship enabled and that will lead to government propaganda. Once the government decides what you can know and what you can't know, your ability and to make decisions will be reduced and your freedoms to act will be reduced. We oppose that legislation because on principle, we want people to have as many freedoms as they can. 
In finishing, I want to say that One Nation is different from other political parties because our values are different, we're socially conservative and we make evidence-based decisions and we're practical about that. One Nation has elected members in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. And what that tells me, and hopefully you, is that the election of these members of parliament, federally and in the state, shows a primary for vote for One Nation is a vote that's very well spent. So I hope that you'll think about One Nation carefully because we're a very, very different political party to everybody else. Thank you.